effective ABC Seamless really is. This is CNN. Regularly scheduled programming will not be seen at this time, so we can bring you the CNN special. The drum beats on in New Hampshire. The Democrats are here. Democrats are crossing the state. And I'm here in New Hampshire to give the people a real choice. Spelling out their plans for jump-starting the economy. Pride and dignity and work and jobs. Hi, nice to meet you. Providing affordable health care. To me, health care is the first issue. Let's get that thing figured out. I've just eaten everybody a lot. Each telling voters why he should be the next Democratic presidential nominee. One of them may well be just that. And I need your help. Thank you very much. I'm Bernard Shaw. In the end, Americans do not cast ballots for platforms or policies. They vote for people, people they like and trust. Tonight, as part of CNN's comprehensive campaign coverage, a look at the five Democrats seeking their party's nomination. Not everything they stand for, but who they really are. We'll be back after this new summary. Good evening, I'm Andrea Arsenault. Presidential candidates walk the streets of New Hampshire today looking for votes. Here's how they stand according to a CNN USA Today Gallup tracking poll. Likely Democratic voters have given Paul Fungus a 21-point lead over Bill Clinton. 60% of likely Republican voters prefer President Bush, while 33% favor Patrick Buchanan. But the president was shouted down in Derry by AIDS activists. Police removed the protesters while Mr. The Bush told the crowd that funding for AIDS research has increased during his administration. A Milwaukee jury has found that serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was sane when he killed and mutilated 15 young men. He will receive 15 consecutive life terms in prison. Dahmer still faces a murder charge in Ohio. There's not enough evidence to prosecute another murder he says he committed in Milwaukee. A packing less of a wallop than previous storms, more wind and rain struck Southern California today. The slightly weaker storm gave waterlogged residents a chance to show up defenses against the floodwaters. Officials say the Los Angeles River rose seven feet in one hour. Now back to Bernard Shaw for the battle to lead the Democrats. Welcome back. In a moment, a special assignment takes a look at the five Democrats who would be president. The battle to lead the Democrats is brought to you by Wausau for all lines of business insurance. Wausau does it all. Your daddy. Oh, uh, honey, I can't wear that tie. I'm an insurance man. And but we, it's Wausau insurance. Right, right, right. You well, always honey. say Wausau isn't like other insurance yeah, companies. Honey, you do say that. I know I say that. But Experts but, in business um, insurance, when I, group health, uh, well, pensions, pensions, casualty. And proper sugar. Yeah, proper tea, honey. Hmm, nice tie, Bob. Well, actually, we've always tried to watch what we eat. I mean, okra and garlic are, what, part of our lives. Now we hear a lot about garlic. Yeah. So we take quiet, odor-free garlic tablets. And you know, they really are odor-free. Millions of Europeans have been taking quiet, odor-free garlic tablets for years. It's part of their daily diet. It's the best. And now it's available in this country, too. Kwai is available at quality drugstores, health and natural food stores, and general nutrition centers. Kwai, science and nature working for you.
San Antonio, where we predict you'll have the best time every time. For a free vacation kit with valuable discounts, give us a call. Bill Clinton, governor of Arkansas, has been the early front runner in New Hampshire. He has money and organization and a campaign whose direction is uncertain. Special Assignments Ken Bodie reports. Bill Clinton, the media anointed front runner, All right, let's go see the pig. brings an outdoor pig roast, a taste of Arkansas, to New Hampshire. And I live and breathe. <laughs> What's your name? Bob Gallagher. Good to see you. President, good luck to you. New Hampshire, the state of face-to-face, one-on-one campaigning. A lot of what I say and do now is informed by the personal stories of the people I have met in this state. But when you are the front runner, sometimes the people you meet are outnumbered by the reporters and the television cameras. Gotta get you some gloves. Hi. Hi. How you doing? No cameras inside, guys. We'll rotate. Okay. Bill Clinton is a long way from where this all began. In Hope, Arkansas, population 10,290 on the Texas-Arkansas border. Here, as a lad, Bill Clinton saw people struggle to make ends meet. Clinton's father died in an auto accident months before Bill was born. His mother went to New Orleans to study nursing, so he stayed with grandparents who ran a general store in the black part of town. My grandparents raised me till I was four. Um, and in a funny way, uh, middle and lower middle class white people had more contact, I think, with, uh, with blacks. And there was more interracial contact then than, than, there has, than there is now in many of our uh, cities outside the South. And I learned a lot about life in that store. His early years with his grandparents and Hope was absolutely um, defining in terms of how he thought of himself. Watching people who were doing the very best they could you know, getting up every day, struggling against a lot of tough odds, uh, but not losing their faith and feeling positive about life and not becoming embittered. Clinton worked his way through Georgetown University and also worked for Arkansas Senator William Fulbright at the Capitol. He won a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, then on to Yale Law School. But Bill Clinton always knew he would return to Arkansas to run for public office. I just decided when I was 16 that even though I came from a family with no particular political influence and certainly had no money, that, that uh, I would prepare myself to, uh, to try to serve. And if I were lucky enough to do it, then I would do it. Back in Arkansas, he tried first for Congress and lost. Next election, he won Attorney General. As your Attorney General, I've gained priceless experience in the workings of all levels of our government. After just one term, at age 32, Bill Clinton won the governorship. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of governor of Arkansas, of governor of Arkansas. The official wonder kid of Arkansas politics, the nation's youngest governor. But Clinton's Camelot was over quickly. He raised taxes on license plates. His wife, Hillary, kept her maiden name. Arkansans considered the Clintons a little aloof, a little too modern, a little out of touch. I did not believe that it would cause a, a big ruckus if I kept my maiden name when we were married, but it did. It caused a big ruckus. And it really interfered with people listening to what we had to say about issues that were very important to us. After just one term, they threw him out of office. He was surprised. He only realized he was in trouble late, and I think when he actually lost, he was, he was stunned and devastated, totally devastated. I love this state even more today than I did yesterday. It was a surprise, and it was a shock. As hurt as I was, I realized that I'd made a lot of mistakes, that I had a lot to learn. I was still young, and I wasn't going to give it up. Steve, thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. There'll be another time for you, my friend. <laughs> Come on. 
Clinton says that he began preparing to take back the governorship the very day after he lost it. And he did take it back for four more terms. But there are those in Arkansas who believe that early defeat marked Bill Clinton deeply. It made him a man who favored expediency and pragmatism over whatever principles he'd had in his first term. Is it good politics or is it a man who's lost his principles because he's, he's obsessed with, uh, with electability? Today, Bill Clinton is America's most senior governor, a career politician who has been in public office virtually his entire adult life. Now, that's the first thing they tell me. They say, if you run for national office, never talk while you're walking. They dress up every time. Bill Clinton is this year's new generation Southern moderate, positioned to contrast himself with losing Democratic liberals like McGovern, Mondale, and Dukakis. He's a fellow who is bright, who is charming, who is engaging, who has been running for president, I think, all of his adult life, uh, and whose message basically to the people is, vote for me, I'm an electable Democrat. I want to be your president very badly. If you believe we can come together again, then I'm your candidate and I need your help. Thank you very much. Well, this is it. This is the official kickoff to the presidential campaign in New Hampshire. The Democrats are here. His program includes middle class tax breaks and making welfare recipients work for their checks. And we are privileged to have Bill Clinton of Arkansas. Governor, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's still hard for a lot of us to believe here in New Hampshire that we're in the times that we are in. Well, I have a lot of sympathy with the people here. The things that the people are going through here are more or less what my state went through for most of the 1980s. Arkansas, after 11 years of Bill Clinton in the governor's mansion, remains a mixed picture. He gets high marks for increasing jobs and especially for an ambitious education program. But the state still ranks near the bottom of most national lists in per capita income, teachers pay, and environmental quality. And what I say to my critics is this. Show me a governor in the 1980s with all the problems that we had, all the things we had to overcome. Name one whose administration changed more lives. Bill Clinton is the well-polished candidate with the longest executive record and lots of ideas. The question is, how well does he get the job done? If opponents say, Clinton will do for America what he has done for Arkansas. Will voters want to buy that package? Ken Bodie, CNN, special assignment. Since accusations in a supermarket tabloid of an extramarital affair, Bill Clinton's campaign is on questionable ground. The questions about Clinton are placing pressure on the other Democrats to present themselves as the alternative this year. Mariel, you're amazing. Oh, JP, stop it. No, really, you get to play so many people, yet you're always you. Well, I do get a lot of help from a terrific hairstylist, I trust. We all know how important that is. The thing I love is he doesn't make me just look good for the moment. He really takes care of my hair. I'll bet I know he does that. Yes, of course. He only uses Paul Mitchell products, just like I do at home. Well, I won't argue with that, but I will say this. Yes, JP? I still think you're amazing. Paul Mitchell products are guaranteed only when purchased in fine salons. I like a really big, round burger. And I like them really, really thick. You're gonna have a baseball. Smells come up and the juices drip down. I can almost hear it. By the sound, just by the sound, then I know it's ready. Whoa. Wait. It's not done. Done. Now it's done. Oh, it's done. A1. It's how burgers are. Perfect. Done. When the aches and pains, the fever and chills of the flu get you, it's important to know doctors are recommending Tylenol four times more than aspirin for the flu. Doctors know there's more medicine in extra strength Tylenol than regular aspirin. It's stronger relief for the aches and chills of the flu. Tylenol, the doctor's choice by four to one, and the pain reliever hospitals use most.
And this winter, try new maximum strength Tylenol cough. It's strong medicine for coughs. If all dogs were just puppies, all we'd make is puppy chow with extra protein and iron. Because puppies need up to twice the nutrition of adult dogs. But dogs are different. That's why we make Puppy Chow Dog Chow Fit and Trim and Purina High Pro. Vet tested, veterinarian recommended. Paul Songus was the first Democrat to throw his hat into the ring. The former Massachusetts senator has a detailed economic plan, but also a compelling personal story. It is that heady moment in presidential politics. For Paul Songus, days like this are a rare contrast to all those times when he is out there alone. For 10 months, he says, he was debating himself. When he swam in Maine for the cameras last July, the former senator from Massachusetts had a problem. He took the plunge here to make a point. There is no um, cancer in me as far as the doctors can see. It was lymphoma, diagnosed in 1984. Then a cancer that could be treated, but not cured. Come on, Chris. Songus, family at his side, beat it. A battle with death, he says, changes your view of life. You're wiser. You've seen things that most people have not um, have been forced to see, and hopefully there's a perspective that comes out of that. If cancer altered Songus's view of the future, his past also shaped that view. He was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, an old New England textile center, poor and gritty. His best friend was his twin sister, Thalia. When they were infants, their mother contracted tuberculosis. They were eight when she died. We became very close. We fought a lot. We played together a lot. And with a family that was not as complete with my mother having been ill and dying when we were very young, we were very close. And so we were always intertwined in one another's lives. Songus's father was an immigrant from Greece. Themo Songus preached hard work and made his children work every day in the family dry cleaning business. Paul Songus says today that to know him is to understand those roots. To know me, you only have to know two people. One, the boy who worked in his father's dry cleaners when the city was going into decline. And secondly, the uh, young man who went to the Peace Corps. In 1962, Songus graduated from Dartmouth College and headed for a two-year stint in Ethiopia his first venture away from New England. I consider in terms of your professional career, those two years to be the best years of my life and how I felt about myself. After the Peace Corps, Songus went to Yale Law School and passed up the big money of a corporate law career to return to Lowell and start a family and a career in politics. In 1974, in the Democratic sweep after Watergate, Songus won a long-shot bid for Congress. We were so self-important. We were the reformers. Uh, we were the ones who ran against Nixon. We were going to change Washington. Songus didn't change Washington in his two House terms. He just served his constituents and got reelected. In 1978, he spotted another underdog opportunity to move up. He ran against incumbent Ed Brooke, the Senate's only black. Another Songus victory. He's a guy who has done a whole series of things in spite of people telling him that you can't do it. And uh, people say, gee, how almost like, how dare he run for president? Uh, he doesn't fit the intangibles. And the answer is, he's a guy who has for 20 years now been doing things that people told him uh, he shouldn't try to do and succeeding at them. And I'm sure that's what's motivating him. I think he sees a path that maybe nobody else sees He's willing to discuss it with other people, but if he doesn't hear a, you know, an acceptable reason to change course, he won't. Songus fell in with a group of younger senators who wanted to change the course of the Democratic Party, 
away from knee-jerk liberalism. By the end of his first Senate term, Songus had the coloration of a maverick. He bucked his party's leadership on key votes, such as supporting the big Chrysler United bailout that most Congress Democrats oppose. Um, his independence was just beginning, but suddenly it looked like the end. In the shower, he discovered a lump. There were tests and more tests. It was lymphoma. Everybody made sure that you stuck together, that you didn't talk about it, that nobody outside the family knew about this other than the doctors. The tumor on his neck kept growing. Songus decided that if his time was limited, it belonged to his family. Last Friday night, I was lying there in the darkness, and it became obvious to me what I had to do. Some of this decision is a surprise to me, too. But I knew at that time what The promising Senate career was over. His doctors began a long treatment of chemotherapy. Then, a dangerous experiment, a bone marrow transplant. It was a seven-year climb back to health. Songa stayed with his family. He helped his wife earn a law degree just in case. Paul Songus was blessed with life, and he sees the world through different eyes now. I wasn't supposed to be here. I think you become much more focused on family, and you try to um, pour yourself into your kids so they remember you. So, and I didn't remember my mother, so that's you. That's important to me, that my kids know who I was, and part of me is uh, inside of them. So your obligation to them goes to the world in which they will live. So I... Thus was born Paul Songus's new political agenda. This book is the 83-page Songus Economic Development Manifesto. It's the backbone of his campaign message. Politically, Paul Songus is not predictable. He strongly favors abortion rights, but also supports nuclear power. He supports comprehensive national health insurance, but also is a self-styled, pro-business Democrat who favors a capital gains tax cut. Paul Songus was out there alone for a long time. <laughs> CNNs were the only network cameras late this summer at a clam bake in Maine when he found some old friends from Senate days. Majority Leader George Mitchell and former Senator Ed Muskie. I look forward to hearing your speech. I haven't heard your speech since you're in the Senate. I hope you've improved. <laughs> Paul Songus is the first cancer survivor ever to run for president. Keep a time, my friend. Wherever he goes, people reach out to touch him. It is almost mystical. When they come up and they shake my hand, they'll grab my arms. Oh, he was my favorite. It's almost as if I need to be reassured. Thank you. He says this race for the presidency is, quote, the obligation of my survival. The courage Paul Songa showed in his battle with cancer is unquestioned. What voters need to measure now is whether his record, his actual record in public life, merits him serious consideration for the office of the presidency. Ken Bodie, CNN, special assignment. Your recommendation for our business insurer? Wausau, sir. Wausau for workers' compensation. And group health. And pensions. And property. And? And no one can beat their service. Hmm. Well, well, I didn't know that. He's coming back. Good work. For all your business insurance, it's the professionals from Wausau. Well, we want to be together, but not too close together. Yeah, she's never seen the beach. And she wants to see every mile of it. For the way you travel today more than ever, the smart money is on budget. Now at Budget, get an economy car with unlimited mileage for just $99 a week. The smart money is on Budget. How's your sinus pain when you bend over? It's definitely worse when you bend over. It feels like somebody's jabbing you with an ice pick. It hurts. It's bad. Did you know all these sinus pain formulas have the same medicine? No, I didn't know that. 
I'm surprised that Sudafed Sinus is the same as all the rest of these. Dristan Sinus is different. It's got the modern pain reliever ibuprofen. I'll try Dristan Sinus. What do you feel now? No, no hassle, no problems, no drowsiness, no pain with Dristan Sinus. Ice picks are gone. Dristan, the face of relief today. The battle to lead. The Democrats will continue after this word from your local cable company. She chose a difficult routine, but Thompson looks extremely poised and graceful. And Newsome with a beautiful dive. It's obvious the judges like that one. This part of the course has given skiers trouble all day, but Riley looks well on his way to a goal. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Iowa reminds those who aren't competing in Elberville that good health and fitness are important to you, too. After all, just because you aren't a U.S. Olympic team athlete doesn't mean you can't feel like one. Here are three reasons why you should advertise your product on cable television in Des Moines. Number one, you'll reach your customers if they're men, women, or children. Number two, you can buy television commercials on any of 16 Heritage Cablevision channels. Number three, and best of all, a 30-second commercial costs as little as $35. Call Heritage Advertising Sales today. Cable television advertising. It's affordable and it's effective. This is CNN. Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa is an old-time, tub-thumping liberal. He is leading the charge to restore traditional Democratic values to the party. It is proving to be a high-risk strategy. It is cold early morning in Franklin, New Hampshire. Cold and damp. Senator Tom Harkin is working with a city street crew, tearing up pavement and ripping out pipes. Replacing a fire hydrant. If you want to go down, right, okay. All because Harkin wants people to know that he's a hard worker, in touch with common people. And that he is eager to take on George Bush. See, George Bush, he loves getting his picture taken with working people. But I like being with working people. Harkin has performed hundreds of work days like this for 17 years all over his native Iowa, and now all around the country. He wants to prove to voters what he really is like and who he is not like. Rusting away. that George Herbert Walker Bush has got feet of clay and I'm going to take a hammer to him. The Harkin journey began in this tiny Iowa town back in the days of the Great Depression with little money for medical care or clothes but an aching to succeed. Well, this son of a coal miner and an immigrant mother aspires to the highest office in his life. That's the American dream. In coming, you learn those real fundamental values that get you prepared to deal with life. Hard work, being frugal. Heck, no one had any money there, so you had to pinch every penny. And individual responsibility because you had to take care of yourself. You can't live in Iowa or any other place that where people farm for a living and not understand that uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. We know about putting things in the ground in the spring and if luck is with you and nature is okay having them grow in the summer and then harvesting them in the, in the fall. We know about that at a very deep level. Tom Harkin is a traditional unabashed liberal. His hero was a party icon who demanded that Democrats be Democrats. I don't much like the drift in my party. And I kind of feel like Harry Truman did in 1948 when he said, you know, he said, if you run a Republican against a Republican, 
You can bet your bottom dollar a Republican will win every time. <laughs> and, if Herkin uh, is an unapologetic Democrat, he attributes it to the work ethic he inherited from his father, a coal miner who died of black lung disease. Pride and dignity and work and jobs. That's what my party stood for, and that's what made me a Democrat. Harkin has strong ties to organized labor, another traditional Democratic position. He wasted no time last October joining a picket line in Manchester, New Hampshire. Harkin knew deprivation well. He craved an education, and he hitchhiked 20 miles every day to attend a Catholic school in Des Moines. The Navy was his ticket out of rural poverty. During the Vietnam War era, he taxied damaged jets to repair bases. It was just assumed that when your time came, you would serve your country. No question about it. It was expected of you. After his tour in Vietnam and during law school, Harkin went back to Southeast Asia as a Congressional Committee staffer. It was then he brought to light the brutal tiger cages used by the South Vietnamese to torture prisoners. That established the public man. On his second try, Harkin won a House seat in 1974 and moved to the Senate in 1984. His closest advisor, he says, has always been his wife Ruth, who he credits with changing his view of the world. Here's a young guy. I grew up, went in the Navy as a Navy pilot. I got out and I had one view of women. And it was that women were subservient to men. I mean, I'd sort of been taught that. Women did one thing, men did another. Thank God I met Ruth, because she opened up my eyes and my mind. I think the fact that he has two daughters uh, uh, affects him a lot in how he feels about women and about how he feels that uh, they should have uh, the same kind of advantages as, uh, uh, that men do. And we're delighted to have Mr. Tom Harkin, uh, uh, Senator, Democrat from Iowa, in our studios this morning. He's in Harkin takes a particularly aggressive stand on so-called women's issues. I'm pro-choice, and I'll tell you why. I don't trust the government to make that kind of decision. I put my trust in individual women. Our guest this morning has been Senator Tom Harkin. Good luck to you, Senator. This is Frank Harkin, Tom's older brother. He lives alone in the house where Tom and some of his brothers and sisters were born a half century ago. He's been deaf since early childhood, and concern for Frank's plight has made Tom Harkin an advocate for the disabled. We're going to have disabled people fully integrated in all aspects. He has interpreters sign for the deaf whenever he can. A bill barring discrimination against the disabled is one of Harkin's proudest accomplishments. And like most of his Democratic opponents, he also favors national health insurance. Be proud of Democrats and take that fight right into George Bush's face. His passionate rhetoric wins attention. Raspberries. And Harkin knows how to play to the television cameras that have started to pursue him. However, what also follows Tom Harkin is a reputation as a volatile and angry man. Mike Dukakis made a mistake because he didn't fight back. And I'll tell you, they better not try to Willie Hortonize me. If they do, they better duck. If the Republicans kick me, I don't yelp. They kick me, and they're going to lose a leg. They start throwing that crap at me, and they better duck. He's a junkyard dog. And what Bush better understand, he's not going to flip a Willie Horton deal out there on him, and he's not going to be able to throw a question at you, what would you do if your wife got raped? Because Harkin will come on gloat, he'll come across the stage on you, you don't know. I perceive him to be a very tough man, but uh, I think tough is good. This is the kind of person that uh, simply doesn't, uh, you know, break under pressure. Tom Harkin's opponents believe that sort of toughness will wear thin on the American electorate. The question comes up, do you want a pit bull for president? And I think the American people are going to be wanting more than just, uh, here's what's wrong. The challenge is, what are your solutions? To take the government back from the special interest and the privileged few and make it work for us for a change. Tom Harkin is the purest litmus test Democrat in the field, in the tradition of the New Deal and the Great Society. Democrats need to decide in these presidential primaries if they want to turn to those old-fashioned party values or if that kind of liberalism is what has lost them so many elections lately. Ken Bodie, CNN, Special Assignment.
24 hours a day across Europe, Asia, and America, 70,000 of the best people on the ground are working to bring you the best service in the sky. Delta, you love to fly and it shows. Things are different. The all-new Pontiac Grand Am proves it. Things are better because no import at its price can match the power of its 16-valve engine and the control of its standard anti-lock brakes. Not a cord, not Camry, no one. In fact, Consumer's Digest named the Grand Am a Best Buy. Pontiac's new Grand Am, a new kind of excitement. Well, actually, we've always tried to watch what we eat. I mean, okra and garlic are, what, part of our lives. Now we hear a lot about garlic. Yeah. So we take Kwai odor-free garlic tablets. And you know, they really are odor-free. Millions of Europeans have been taking Kwai odor-free garlic tablets for years. It's part of their daily diet. It's the best. And now it's available in this country, too. Kwai is available at quality drugstores, health and natural food stores, and general nutrition centers. Kwai, science and nature working for you. We built this business. I hit the brakes. You know, they're at a lock brakes. It was close, but we stopped in time. Build this business. Every year they plant new trees. Dad says they make good things for trees. After my accident, they advanced my insurance benefits and built me a ramp and got me back on my feet. We built this business to build your dreams. Senator Bob Carey of Nebraska entered the presidential race with all the glamour that comes with celebrity. But he is a newcomer who sometimes mystifies voters along the campaign trail. The band played waltzing Matilda, and the old man answered the call. Year by year, their numbers get fewer. It is as if he is looking for lost friends among the fallen. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. The band warms up, and for a moment he's alone with his thoughts. Baltimore on Veterans Day, 1991. Earlier amongst the uh, headstones, I thought the most difficult thing that we have to do on a Veterans Day is to set aside whatever it is that we're doing in our lives to make the effort to remember. And to remember the loneliness and the fear and the questions that all men and women have had when they're serving. Uh, the biggest question being, will my country remember me? Thank you very much. Even as he runs for president, Bob Carey remembers. It happened 25 years ago, halfway around the world, in a place called Vietnam. A shadowy figure tossed a grenade at his feet. The explosion changed Bob Carey's life. I just, you know, went right off, and I had gone down in a firing position, and it was very rocky. And we, by the way, had taken our shoes and boots and socks off in order to move quiet, and that was probably one of the, re one of the reasons the damage was as serious as it was. And it, the blast just sheared, it caught and sheared the leg pretty serious. Kerry joined the tens of thousands of Vietnam wounded who slowly came home. He came home to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital with gangrene in his wounded leg and facing a certain amputation. When I came out in the recovery room, the question that I want to know is how, you know, how much did they cut off? You know, and so my poor mother and father huddled up against the wall uh, together. I made my mother come over and say, how much is left? And she looked at me and she said, there's a lot left. And she was talking about here, not here. Bob Carey grew up in Lincoln in a large family commonly likened to television's Brady Bunch. He's the divorced father of two children. In the service, he was a lieutenant. He had gone through strenuous training as a Navy SEAL, a ticket to danger in Vietnam. 
Terry was gung-ho about the Vietnam War until he got over there. From the very beginning, I think he began to wonder if this war was all he thought it was or if it was about everything he thought it was going to be about. Bob Terry was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Nixon. It was an honor he almost refused. He returned to Nebraska, went into the restaurant business, and made a million dollars. If you so swear or affirm... When he started in politics... I do. He began at the top as governor in 1982. Somewhere out in the he brought youth and glamour to the job. He ran marathons on his prosthesis. Had a celebrated romance with movie star Deborah Winger. And a love affair with his home state. Nebraska just decided it, it wanted to do something fun and exciting and spontaneous and, and glamorous, and it did it. Terry's rise in politics has been so fast that where he stands and what he stands for are elusive to many. I think the problem generates from the fact that he is constantly thinking and therefore constantly changing. And that's probably what throws people off. We Bob win! We Bob win! We want Bob! We Bob Kerry is not afraid to change his mind, to say he was wrong. He did that when he moved from a position opposing to supporting abortion rights. And again, when he moved from opposing to supporting a Supreme Court ruling which protected flag burning. There are things where uh, you are not 100% certain when you make a decision. Uh, and you can get accumulation of evidence that says, wait a minute. Uh, what is your position, Senator, on reducing the size of the National Guard and the reserves? Kerry also is not afraid to say. Well, I don't have one yet something not commonly heard from politicians. Honest answer. Terry has offered the most detailed and the most expensive national health insurance plan of any Democrat in the race. To me, healthcare is the first issue. Unless you get oh, that thing figured out, I've just eaten everybody I've been, alive. Uh, and though he now acknowledges it was a success, Cheer up. Bob Kerry originally opposed the war in the Persian Gulf. And it will be difficult for his opponents to say that he doesn't understand war. Wherever he goes, he carries his Vietnam experience deep within him. That experience was with him in 1988 at a victory rally when he celebrated winning his Senate seat by singing a song. For 10 weary weeks, I kept myself alive while around me the corpses piled higher. Then a big turkey shell knocked me ass over it and when I awoke in my hospital bed, I saw what it had done, and I wished I were dead. Never knew there were worse things than dying. And the band played Waltzing Matilda. It is a song of war seen through the eyes of an Australian soldier who lost his legs during World War I. all over again. I watched my old comrades, how proudly they marched. Renewing old dreams and lost glory. The old men marched proudly, all bent stiff and sore. The power of tired old men from a forgotten war. And the young people ask, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band played waltzing Matilda. And the old men answer the call. His biography is compelling. He runs appealingly against the grain of the standard packaged politician. But the changeability you saw in Kerry and the sometimes incomplete grasp of issues leaves the impression of an unfinished public man. 
perhaps unready for the challenges of the presidency. Ken Bodie, CNN, special assignment. When we asked, what's a strong name in headache relief? A lot of people said... Excedrin. 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 When we asked, what's a strong medicine for pain? A lot of people said... Ibuprofen. 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 Well, we put our heads together and came up with this solution for headache pain. Excedrin. Ibuprofen. Excedrin. Ibuprofen. Introducing Excedrin IB. Now an ibuprofen medicine from Excedrin. Ibuprofen relief for tough headaches. New Excedrin IB. The headache ibuprofen. How can you stop a throbbing toothache? Massage your hand with ice. How do you cure poison ivy? Try oatmeal. How do you quiet a colicky baby? Run the vacuum. How do I know these cures really work? Because my staff and I spent months interviewing over 500 doctors and health professionals to bring you this incredible book, the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies from the editors of Prevention Magazine Health Books. I'm Bill Gottlieb, Editor-in-Chief. And after writing about health for over 14 years, I can assure you there has never been a more complete and practical encyclopedia of home healing techniques than the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. Over 670 pages, 2,300 remedies, the wisdom and experience of over 500 top U.S. doctors and health experts covering over 130 different health problems. You'll learn how a steaming cup of coffee can stop an asthma attack, how plain yogurt soothes a sunburn. From controlling diabetes to ending diaper rash, you'll find it all in the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. Call now for the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. Try it absolutely free for 21 days. Then if you choose to keep it, pay in three easy installments of only $8.98. Plus you'll get this Meals That Heal cookbook free. In the meantime, use your blow dryer to soothe an earache. Try rubbing aspirin on a... Call 1-800-351-1500. Jerry Brown, the former governor of California, is making his third run for the Democratic presidential nomination. He's charted a course different from his opponents and is rocking the boat wherever he goes. Special Assignment's Brooks Jackson reports. There is a voice of bitter discontent echoing across the political landscape of New Hampshire in 1992. It's a familiar voice with unfamiliar words. That's the dirty little secret. They have plenty of money in Washington. They're just misspending it. Out of inertia, out of blindness, out of greed, and out of corruption. And that tells you something is rotten in the state of politics in this country. How are you? Great. Jane Ciccarelli. Hey, nice to see you. I want to look at this labor right. The best in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Brown is back. Again. Brown's my name. Yes, Mr. Brown, I know that. You do, huh? How you doing? He was governor of California for two terms. They may call me a moonbeam, but I fight the guns of the power. Hey, how are you? He ran for president, 1976 and 1980. I want to give you a copy of my labor record here. Now he's running a third time with this year's boldest message. He says today's politicians, Democrats and Republicans, have sold their souls to the moneyed interests that keep them in office an incumbent protection machine. And I'm here in New Hampshire to give the people a real choice, not a phony choice, bought and paid for by the very people who are causing the misery that drives people into these unemployment offices. And the whole scheme is to have meaningless campaigns with meaningless commercials so you think it's meaningless and you don't do anything. Brown speaks with the fervor of a religious convert. Hi, how are you? Hi. Good Nice to see you. Until recently, he was raising millions from wealthy donors for the Democratic Party in California. Home babies, isn't that uh, a classic? Yeah. This is a people's campaign. We're challenging the incumbent machine of both parties. Now, he'll accept only modest contributions. So I'm only taking $100, no more than that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> From his childhood, Jerry Brown had conflicting attitudes about politicians, starting with his father, Pat Brown, elected district attorney of San Francisco when Jerry was four and a half, elected governor of California when Jerry was 20. He was a, a very affable, outgoing person. And every time we walked into a restaurant, every time we went anywhere, it was always, oh, Pat Brown, the district attorney or the attorney general. And, oh, and here's your son and your daughters. And so we're on stage all the time. 
Uh, he didn't like it at all. He didn't like being tagged around and shown off, if I can use that expression. And uh, uh, he would show it at times, too. You need someone who's going to fight the power, whether it's the media, whether it's the big money, the insurance lobby, the medical lobby, I don't care what it is, unless you're willing to fight those people, nothing will change. And On the campaign trail, Brown talks mostly about ideas, revealing little of a personal nature. At first, Brown rejected political life entirely, honoring a vow of silence in a Jesuit seminary, studying to be a priest. And the reason I did was I've always had a um, deep longing for spirituality, for understanding the meaning of life, for finding out uh, what is the real inner essence of things. You know, what, what really is life all about? That's always been my quest. But the excitement of politics and power was too strong. Brown says he loved being governor. He cut taxes, strengthened environmental laws. Many said he brought excellence into government. Eventually, though, California voters grew tired of him. You can say about a lot of politicians that they're inconsistent or, or they're wishy-washy, but within uh, uh, Jerry Brown, uh, uh, those kinds of actions uh, uh, went to the ex extreme. For example, in Prop 13, in a matter of weeks, he went from a, uh, a loud opponent of Prop 13 to a firm supporter of it. People get tired of I'm tired of my uh, voice, uh, tell you tired of the, seeing me on television. Defeated for the Senate in 1982, Brown left politics. I shall return. Never married, he resumed his pilgrimage of the spirit. Mexico, Japan, six months studying Zen philosophy. India to discover how Mother Teresa, as Brown put it, in the face of overwhelming poverty, could still have the joy and the wholehearted commitment that I saw in Mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity and the volunteers that joined them. And every day uh, I'd uh, help people, feed them, give them medicine, uh, cut their hair, bathe them. Some of them were not able to uh, take a bath, they were too far gone. And every day somebody would die. Gladys, meet Jerry Brown. Jerry hey. Brown, I right. love seeing you on TV. You did? Yes, I, I hope you win. Thanks. Is that, that's almost an endorsement, isn't it? It's almost an endorsement. It is an endorsement. Thank you. Always, Jerry Brown follows his own path. Intense, self-confident, he perplexes more traditional politicians. Hello there. Hi. How you doing? Did you see it? Third page. To some, arrogant. To others, driven to do the right thing by real concern about issues. He would call me at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning to talk about some of these issues uh, when he was into them, uh, when he felt that things weren't going right. Today, as you sit in convention, over half of the American people have seceded from their political democracy. They're not voting. As party chairman, Brown says he tried to build a grassroots organization with money. But despite the millions spent by the party and its candidates, California Democrats lost big in 1990. And we'd spent $33 million. So the party professionals looked around, they said, well, Brown didn't raise enough money. I thought to myself, wait a minute here, $33 million? No, that wasn't the problem. The problem is we're not standing for something. Because you know all campaigns are about getting $1,000 contributions. That's what they are. And I just wonder how many people in this room have never given $1,000 to a politician. I'd like you to raise your hand. If you never gave... $1, so once again, Jerry Brown is renouncing traditional politics, even as he runs for president. 99% of the people have not. Politicians are totally dependent on a wealthy elite to get the money to get on television. Condemning the money game he once played himself. Rejecting old alliances. A risky message. There is a very heavy penalty for telling the truth about what's going on in politics today. It's ostr you're ostracized. That you're basically walking out of this tight little club that is controlling America. Most people agree with Brown's anti-political message, but it may be hard for them to see this former political fundraiser as a trustworthy messenger. 
and perhaps harder still for voters to embrace such an unconventional pilgrim as their president. Brooks Jackson, CNN Special Assignment. In the early 90s, the real estate business changed. I've got your financing seminar, two closings, and a showing. Busy day. Busy morning. Professionals took control, trained to use the latest marketing tools, responsive to the real human issues. He's not moving, but we've got a meeting set for tomorrow. One organization set the pace. I love this business. Better homes and gardens. Real estate. It's there in the way an officer smiles. In the way a steward remembers your name. A kindness that comes easily. A genuine warmth. Service that is truly a step above. Come, and for a week or so, allow yourself to be absolutely spoiled by the people of Holland, America, who've made us the best cruise line in the world. Hi, welcome to McDonald's. What do you want with your fries? The one-of-a-kind taste of McDonald's Big Mac or the big beefy quarter pounder with cheese. Either way, in the McDonald's Extra Value Meal, you always get an order of world-famous fries and a Coke Classic. But you gotta pick the burger. Dominique, the lane was yours. How'd you get inside? Hey, what can I say? Dominique, what do you want with your fries? Hey, now there's a question. What you want is what you get. The Extra Value Meal. At McDonald's today. What do you want with your fries? Voters here in New Hampshire face hard choices Tuesday. Governor Bill Clinton's campaign continues to slide on winter's ice with new allegations and his denials of draft dodging during the Vietnam era. Former Senator Paul Sungus, the first man in the race, is now the man with the momentum. The scramble is on for all the Democrats to appear presidential and to convince voters that each is the man to take on and beat George Bush in November. I'm Bernard Shaw in New Hampshire. Thanks for joining us. If you would like information on this or any other story produced by CNN Special Assignment staff, write to this address, CNN Special Assignment, Post Office Box 2727, Atlanta, Georgia, 30301. For well over a century, the finest sewing machines have carried the name Singer. But it hasn't been a name you could carry until now. Now everyone can carry the Singer Handy Stitch. Handy Stitch is the most convenient sewing machine I've ever used. And it's a genuine Singer. Just thread it in seconds and away you go. Handy Stitch is perfect for sewing seams. The durable chain stitch assures a clean, secure job every time. Hem come loose? Just reach for your Handy Stitch and it's as good as new. Nothing could be easier. There's no bobbin to wind, fuss with, or lose. Believe me, I'm no seamstress. But the Singer Handy Stitch is so simple, even my husband uses it. This genuine singer is so sturdy, it can tackle tough jobs like this. Yet it's so simple and safe, a child can use it. Make on-the-spot repairs without even removing the garment. Use it for beautiful...